Well, good morning again. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18. Today we are continuing our series on anticipating God. And the title of this message is simply The Supremacy of God. The Supremacy of God. And so at the outset, this is a topic that I confess I feel woefully inadequate to proclaim to you today. So I would appreciate your prayers, because how often do we need to have our gaze lifted by God's Word, to see Him as He is? 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to be, it's going to be a long narrative, we're going to be breaking it up into smaller kind of bite-sized sections as we go, and so we're going to be journeying through it, read a little bit and stop and look at that and journey through it. So thank you in advance for hanging in there. And reading as we go. I don't know how many of you are into PBS, but occasionally at night after the kiddos go to bed, Jessica and I will be flipping through the channels, and a lot of times I'll pause on a, a series called Antiques Roadshow. Are you guys familiar with that show? Oh yeah, we got some fans here. And um, I think it's been on for a long time, but if you're not familiar with that show, it's this team of experts, and they go around and uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating. That's why I always stop on it. They go around to different stops, kind of a, a tour around the country, different municipalities, and people bring in you know, artifacts and antiques and stuff uh, for these folks to evaluate. How much is this worth? Uh, inevitably, most of the stuff that they bring in is not worth uh, a lot of money, but uh, occasionally, like once a show, somebody brings in a legit item, and you just you get, get excited about it. And several seasons back, they made a stopover in Corpus Christi. And a local man there, he, his, his great-grandfather had purchased a painting, an oil canvas painting, uh, back in the 1930s down in Mexico. He bought it in Mexico City, and he'd inherited it, so he, he brings it in. And uh, it, was a, it was a turn-of-the-century piece. It was depicting a local farmer who was out working in the fields. And even though this was a family heirloom for this, this particular fellow, he, he thought that was about what, all it was worth. He didn't know it was worth uh, he thought it just had sentimental value for him. He didn't, he didn't know what it was really worth. In fact, he was so clueless about what he owned that it hung behind a door in his house. As crazy as that is, if you open a door, you couldn't even see the painting hanging in his house. But the appraiser, when he, he brings it in, saw something altogether differently. The appraiser immediately picked up on how rare a piece this was. It was the work of one Diego Rivera, who was a famous Mexican painter. And, and this, was, this particular painting was rare in the sense that it was from early in his career. He was still developing his style. So there was only a couple of paintings that still remained from this era of his life. And added to those two factors was the, this, the, the story of this particular painting. The painting had been cataloged at one point in Mexico City, but had, gone disappe- had disappeared. It had gone missing for 65 years. And so you can just imagine the immediate enthusiasm that comes when this appraiser sees it, when she sees that he brings this in. And in a made-for-TV moment, this expert informs the guy, just, it's just crazy, if your painting that was hanging behind a door in your house, if it went to an auction, it would bring between $800,000 and a million dollars. And you see this guy just physically, his jaw just kind of hits the floor, and he's like, Seriously, seriously, he had no idea what he owned. Total shock. See, the value of the piece was never in question. It hadn't dropped all along the way. In fact, now it was worth more than ever. But the problem, so the problem was not with the painting. The problem was with its perceived value or lack of it. This poor fellow had no idea that what he thought of was just a family heirloom, a relic. It was actually a treasure, and it took a dramatic revelation for him to finally grasp its true worth. Well, as we're about to see in this passage this morning, something far more tragic has happened to the people of Israel. As the people of God, those who have been called to, to bear His name, who have been delivered out of slavery, brought into relationship with Him, the Lord's perceived value in their midst, had declined, and it had declined rapidly. He was no longer considered their supreme treasure, their supreme provider, 
And sadly, the way that they were living reflected that, began to reflect that. And that's to be expected because so go our thoughts about God, so goes our behavior. You see, they, they had heard, these folks, they had heard about God's greatness, about His goodness. But the Israelites needed to see it. They needed to see His worth. And this chapter reveals that. As I mentioned at the outset, this, it serves as one long narrative where there's some purposeful kind of scene shifts that happen over the course of the story. And so those, there's three different acts that we're going to be using as our structure today. Act one is the desperate situation. Act one is this desperate situation that's going to be unpacked in verses 1 to 19. Act two is the divine confrontation as captured in verses 20 to 40. And finally, act three is the gracious provision. That's in verses 41 to 46. So the desperate situation, the divine confrontation, and the gracious provision. Let's read that first act together, beginning at verse 1. This is the Lord's word. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive, and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, how have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord is not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Elijah and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets in, in 50s, by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. and He will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. As we can tell, we're kind of dropping into the middle of a story here. There's some history that's going on. Clearly, Elijah and Ahab have a past, and they are not the best of friends. If Twitter had existed back then, Ahab probably would have Elijah on block, because he didn't want to see anything that Elijah had to say. Elijah never said anything good to Ahab. And that was for good reason, because Ahab was not a good king. He was an evil king. In fact, elsewhere, the writer of Kings talks about how he, was, he, was, he did more evil than all the kings who came before him. In one phrase, it even says, he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Well, that's quite a legacy. He was worse than all the other kings. He led the people away and toward serving Baal. And as a result of all this pagan worship, God has now withdrawn his hand of blessing. That's what he promised in the Old Covenant. That would, that's what verse 2 is referencing here. When it talks about the, the famine being severe in the capital city of Samaria, that's what's going on. This, God's hand of blessing has been taken off. Now, it's so easy for us to read this opening section and begin to look down on the Israelites to begin to think that that, that that was them, that, well, how could they not know better? But before we do that, we have to begin to grasp their situation. They didn't just wake up one morning 
and say, hey, you know what, let's grab some breakfast, go across town, there's a new pagan temple that opened up, let's go check it out. That wasn't, that wasn't the plan, that wasn't the goal. Instead, they weren't, these are folks, they're not a lot different than us today. These are people who face the same issues, the same fears, the same struggles that we do. They were mostly worried about providing for and protecting their families. That, that was what a lot of their life was about. As we see in verse 1, is what verse 1 is telling us is that those basic needs, those basic things that they were searching for in life, they're in serious jeopardy. The land is in the throes of a three-year drought at this point, three years of no crops, and no crops means no food. And you don't have to grow up on a farm to imagine to be able to picture how helpless a situation this leaves you in. I mean, can you just, just think about this? Waking up every morning, morning by morning, looking in the face of your children and legitimately wondering, how am I going to feed them today? How am I going to feed them? It'd be a horrible feeling. And if you're that desperate, if you're that desperate, you'd be willing to possibly try anything. To try anything. Possibly they had heard the stories along the way of how God had, their God had created the heavens and the earth and how He had fed His people in the wilderness. But for them waking up in that moment, it's hard for them to see, how is that going to put food on my table today? That's what they're facing. I've heard He's supreme but in this situation, the one I'm in, he feels weak. I've heard he's loving. But in this moment, he feels as distant as can be, as indifferent as can be. And so in comes Baal. Baal, conveniently enough, just so happens to be a storm god. And if you're in the middle of a drought, you know what sounds kind of appealing? A storm god. And so Baal comes in and he promises to deliver precisely, exactly what the people are needing in their most desperate situations. And that's always the case with idols and false gods. They don't, listen, they don't, come, they don't tempt us by offering us things that we don't need, that we don't feel. Here's, here's what they do. They tempt us by offering exactly what we're, what we're craving, exactly what, specifically what our fears are. They're whispering to those. That's where they come in. Idols, idols function as stop gaps in our lives. They function as stop gaps in our lives. Listen, idols fill in the holes where we think God is lacking somewhere. That's what they do. And because of that, they are easy, easy to justify. A little hidden sacrifice on the side here. It isn't so bad if it helps me to feed my family. A silent prayer in my heart that nobody sees, nobody knows. Maybe that's okay if it can help bring some rain. The writer isn't making light of what they're facing here. We can, we're supposed to feel how much of a crisis this has become. You see that in the text. We're trying to save some of the animals. These are, they're, they're to a point now where they're making very, very, very difficult choices. You go that way, I'll go this way, and maybe, maybe we can save some of the life here. But, in this desperate situation, it turns out that the greater tragedy that Israel is facing isn't physical at all. It's spiritual. More than rain, what they most needed was to experience God's greatness. And isn't that true for all of us? Isn't that true for all of us? Even as we feel the immediate needs of our daily life pressing in on us, the deepest things that we're dealing with, in those moments, it's most likely that our greatest need is spiritual. And what we find here is good news. We find here is that God, we can anticipate God. He plans to meet both of those. Look again at what he calls on Elijah to do in verse 1. He says, Elijah, you go show yourself to Ahab. You've been in hiding, I want you, it's time. Time has come, step out. 
The same Ahab who's actively searching all the lands around you. He's trying to flush you out as much as he can. He's using all of his resources to do it. He wants to kill you. But here's what I promise to do, uh, Elijah. I promise to bring the rains. So Elijah believes God's promise. And he and Obadiah, they link arms. Because once you step out, there's no no going back in. You say, "Here, here here I am. So they both step out in faith, and they go get Ahab. And to end this opening act, the writer again, he's pointing out again the desperate spiritual condition of Israel. He reiterates that. Israel's, this, is, this has been a picture. This desperate situation is a picture. Their physical drought is meant to be a, a, a representation, a dramatic representation of what their spiritual condition is. He's reiterating that in verses 17 to 19. This is what, how that first act closes. Read that with me. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. That's the end of the first act, but we want to keep reading into this second act. We're transitioning into this second act. This divine confrontation. That's act two. Beginning in verse 20. The divine confrontation. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, He is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. For you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered They limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked him, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. They cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Now again, the context is striking here. Mount Carmel is where Baal was supposed to reside. That was his home turf. That's where he set up shop. And so what we see here is that Elijah is volunteering. He's forfeiting the home field advantage. He's volunteering, he's handing it over to them. And he's doing that for a very important reason, because he wants the Israelites, this is why he does this, he wants the Israelites to see that their God is not like the small deities that their minds can conceive of. That's why he's doing this. He's going to tr- he wants them to see that your God transcends any box that you want to put him into. And location is just the beginning of this. This text is, imagine this scene. Imagine what's going on here. This is on Baal's mountain. The ratio is literally 450 to 1. And Elijah, he even gives them first crack at it. He says, you guys go ahead. Take as much time as you want. See what's happening here. See what he's doing. He's, he's, He's giving Baal voluntarily in front of everybody. 
He's giving Baal every conceivable advantage. Like if, they, if their minds could think of an advantage, he's handing it to them. Deities back then, this is what they needed. He's saying, look, he's stacking one on top of the other. You need this, here you go. You need this, here you go. Every advantage, let me serve it up to you. I'm going to hand it to you. You ever seen one of those skits, you had one job to do? That's Baal here. You had one job to do. Just, just bring one little flame. Elijah has handed him the high ground. His prophets, Baal's prophets, have done 99% of the work. In fact, they've worked all day, and even to the point where they've begun to slash themselves in this gruesome ceremony. And all they're asking for, your name's on the line here, Baal. Your reputation's on the line. And all we need is one little flame. It's your time. It's your chance. But you see, here's the problem with false gods. They're good at promising. They're good at whispering in our ears in our desperate situations. They're good at talking to us in the darkest moments. They're good at trying to pull us away. But even after we've done all the work and they've been given every advantage, they can't deliver. They write a lot of checks. Not one of them is cashable. And if this so-called storm deity, he can't consume a single sacrifice in his own temple, how in the world is he supposed to bring rain? The rains that we so desperately need. It's a stunning scene. Even with his people bleeding before him, Baal's incapable of answering. And it ends with this damning summary in verse 29. Listen, look, look at this, listen to this. As midday passed, they raved on. They raved on until the evening, but there was no voice. No one answered, and nobody paid attention. Nobody there. What a horrifying realization. The God that you've hoped in, he's either powerless He's not there, or he just doesn't care. That's what you're left with. And yet then comes a wonderful contrast. Compare this pathetic poverty of Baal to the glorious richness of the true and living God. That's, that's what verses 30 and 35 are unpacking for us. Read that with me. It's a wonderful comparison. What a contrast. Talk about contrast. This is a brilliant contrast. All right, they've had their turn. And Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. Beautiful scene. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water, and pour it on the burnt offering, and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. First, we see that Elijah has all the people come near to him. Come get a front row seat. Come see. And then in their sight, he picks up 12 stones to repair this altar. This is a powerful symbol because originally when God had called the people of Israel, when he had made them his own, there were 12 tribes in Israel. And yet at this point in their history, the kingdoms have been split. They've been torn in two. And so what he's doing by presenting them together, he's representing them as one people, Amen. united again as the people of the true and living God. This is where you belong. At the same time, he's connecting them to their roots, and he's making a declaration. God's promises all those years ago have not failed today. He hasn't stopped being faithful to all of his people. 
They had thrown down his altar, but he had not abandoned them. And by using 12 stones, they see themselves on this altar. They see themselves represented. This is God claiming them as his own. They do not belong to Baal. They belong to him. And then Elijah does the last The very last thing, anybody's ever tried to set a fire, I tried to set one this week, you know this is the last thing you do. You don't dump 12 jars of water on the altar. You don't try to light wet wood. And you especially don't do that in a drought. Imagine how precious these drops are. It's like gold, liquid gold being poured out. 12 jars. That's a commodity you need desperately. And the prevailing thought must have been, Elijah, he's finally lost it. He's gone off the deep end. Why would you do this? Why would you waste precious water by soaking wood that you want to catch on fire? Elijah, don't you know that the prophets of Baal have they've already been exposed? Just get out of there. Get out of there as easily as possible. Why double down? Why take the risk? Victory's in your grasp. All we're looking for is a simple little spark. Why make it impossible? That's exactly, that's exactly the kind of limited, low view of God thinking that's the whole point of this confrontation. It's thinking we're all prone to. But that's what the point of this. Israel, the stories that you've heard, they aren't fairy tales. They aren't fables. The God that we serve is real. He's living. And the same eternal, unchanging God who decided from the beginning, He's the one who decided that water would exterminate flames. That God is the very same God who is here with you right now in your most desperate moments. The limits that we consider absolute are limits that He set in place long ago. He laughs at what we consider impossible. An idol given every advantage, given every human help possible, can't help you in those moments. But the true God, the living God, given every disadvantage, remains unhindered. He remains unhindered to save you. They're a blip. What's a mountain to us is a blip to Him. He remains unhindered. And He remains unhindered to save you to the uttermost. God alone is supreme. And God alone has no limits. And to make that point explicit to the people, look and how he addresses the Lord in verses 36 and 37. I love this prayer from Elijah. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant. And I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And that you have turned their hearts back. It's the whole point. That prayer right there is the whole point of this divine confrontation. This is not ultimately a confrontation between Elijah and the false prophets. This is a confrontation between God and anything else that attempts to be God for his people. He alone is the God of their fathers. He alone is the God of the reigns. And He alone is the sovereign Lord that they must turn to. And we have to appreciate just how wonderful storytelling is here. Once the people hear that prayer, once they hear those words, and they're kind of, that's what's ringing in their ears, and they're leaning in to see what's going to happen. The stage is set. Now the Lord's name, the Lord's reputation, with soaked wood in front of them, is on the line. Look what happens in verse 38. Then, then, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering 
and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Listen, not a second too late, and not a moment too soon, this fire falls. And it doesn't just consume the sacrifice. It, it, that wasn't enough. It consumes everything, even the water that's in the trench. The response of the people is immediate. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Here. Here's the moment that they desperately needed. To finally see Him for the supreme treasure that He is. He, he always was. I was never in doubt, but they needed to see him for the supreme treasure that he is. And in this vivid fashion, you know, the the prophets of Baal that had been seemingly enjoying certain power, they meet this gruesome ending. And make no mistake that trusting in a false god, relying on a false god, is always going to lead to death. That's the point of this ending. For them. Now, this is a familiar story. It's a very familiar story to us. And oftentimes, when we hear it told, this is where it ends. It's kind of the ending of the story. We want to notice something here. Divine Confrontation is Act 2. But that's not where 1 Kings 18 ends. Do you see that? This is a crucial piece here. This is what the writer wants us to to pick up on something. See, Act 3, Act 3 is actually the greatest news in this story. Act 3 is God's gracious provision. Read that with me in verses 41 to 46. This is after all this happens. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat, and drink. For there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Ahab and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Here in these last Six verses, the stunning flow of this story kind of comes into focus. This has been where things were headed all along. God's promise at the outset, the promise that kickstarted this whole thing, it wasn't to bring fire, it was to bring rain. You notice that that, that, that promise is what bookends this story. It's, it's easy to miss sometimes because the, the middle is so dramatic. But the bookend, what, what God's talking about here, what He promised is to bring rain. So the story is not complete until God does what He said He would do in verse 1. And God doesn't just bring little drops. He doesn't bring a sprinkle. When this this drought breaks, it's a deluge. It's a deluge beyond. I mean, could you imagine to see it coming? You know, you've been looking for the horizon for years, looking for rain. Knowing that that meant life. And you start to see it rolling in. Right after God has done this on the mountain. Can you imagine that moment? It's a deluge beyond anything they could have imagined. Anything they could have dreamed. You see, we, we, must, we must recognize God as supreme over all. But, but that alone isn't ultimately what God's after. This is the beauty of this story. God's ultimate intention is for His people 
to experience and to rejoice in His supremacy on their behalf. That's the beauty of this story. The sound of rain at the end of this story is preaching to us today. It's telling us something about what God is like, doesn't it? It tells us a lot, doesn't it? It's speaking to us. God is supreme and He exercises all of that supremacy on behalf of His people. That's the glory of this story. He alone will bring the all-consuming fire, and He alone will bring the life-giving rains. There is no limit to His power, and there is no limit to His goodness. And church, how we need to realize both of those things today, don't we? Because while we live in a modern world, our worries, our fears, our needs, the deepest ones haven't really changed all that much in the last 3,000 years. On top of that, we live in a culture that tells us that God has sentimental value. He's, he's, He's a relic of the past, something you inherited, not worth much. Maybe He comforts you along the way, that that's helpful. But when it comes to dealing with life's real issues, He's at best irrelevant. He's relegated to the sideline while we have all these other solutions, ways of fixing it. And especially when we face desperate situations, how easy, how easy is it for us to be pulled towards one of those solutions? Something other than God to trust in, ultimately. Not that those aren't helpful along the way, but to ultimately trust in. Pulled towards something or someone that promises to fill in the gaps of God's power and His care in our lives. We're all prone to limp along like the Israelites Stuck between two opinions of who is worthy to reign supreme in every area of our lives. So the question comes to us. Is there an area of life where you're hobbling this morning? An area where it sure feels like God needs help. Where he's at such a disadvantage that it's possible he may not be able to work here. See, one of the first steps towards anticipating God in our lives is having God's Word obliterate the confines that our minds try to put on Him. we, We construct little dwellings and we say, He lives here. He dwells here. As long as we're here, we're good. But if we leave this, I'm not so sure. This kind of thinking doesn't allow us to anticipate God, anticipate what He's going to be doing, anticipating Him being at work. See, see if you can relate to this kind of thinking, the, the smaller, low view of God thinking. See if you relate to this. God's supremacy is confined to my quiet time. He feels very powerful in that location with my cup of coffee in the morning. When I walk through the doors of my office, In that moment, he he sure seems to be, back there, seems to be weaker. God's supremacy is, it's confined to those months when the dollars and cents add up at the end. When the numbers don't exactly work out, not sure if he can quite overcome that. God's supremacy is confined to those moments in my marriage when all seems to be going well. When I look back and consider how many buckets of water have been dumped and poured out over over the years, it's, I just don't see how in the world he's ever going to be able to rekindle that. God's supremacy can, can save a pretty good person. It can rescue a person that's doing okay. But when I look at the mess that I've made of my life, I just don't see how he can save me. Where is that area of your life that God just doesn't quite feel like enough? An area where you're tempted to think that he's either powerless or indifferent. 
In any of those cases, has God's supremacy changed? Is he any different? Or is it our perspective that gets off? We, is it, do we, we, we see him with limits. Listen, it's, it's scary. If you stop and consider, it's scary to consider how much of our daily lives can be lived out of a low view of God. How much of our daily lives, functionally, day to day, living out of a low view of God. It is true when we trust Him completely, most likely we probably won't see fire fall from the sky. That may not be happening in Round Rock. But get this. You personally will see that it is the same God who acts. The same God who acts. Think about that. What a hope. It transforms everything. It transforms everything. The same eternal, unchanging God who did rain down fire on Mount Carmel is the God who is present with you right now this morning in your desperate situations, who is able and more than willing to act on your behalf. Church, we don't need to keep hobbling along because our God reigns supreme over all. He isn't a relic that holds sentimental value. He's a present Lord who holds supreme value. But as wonderful a story as this is, wonderful as it is, the greatest expression of God's supreme worth was still to come. You see, this is just a small glimpse into the future. Mount Carmel was a hilltop that supposedly belonged to the forces of evil, but it ended up being the very ground where God's supremacy was revealed. And where his people bowed down to declare that you alone are God. And there was a greater hilltop to come. And this hilltop looked like it belonged to the forces of evil too. On this hill, the odds were overwhelmingly stacked against God. In fact, he willingly took on every possible disadvantage, even to the point of taking on our sin and our suffering and our very death. God, what can you do there? And yet on this hilltop, every single one of his people was represented. Those of us who had turned our backs on him. Those of us who had thrown down his altar in our lives. And on this hill, the greatest display of God's supremacy was revealed for all to see. Here it wasn't a bull that was consumed. It was the Son of God himself crushed in our place. And it wasn't the blood of priests that was spilled, Jesus' own blood flowed out. And he wasn't piercing himself to get the attention of a distant, indifferent, powerless deity. It was God himself in the flesh come near to be pierced for our, our transgressions. You see, Golgotha. Golgotha was the greatest divine confrontation of all time. And it proved once and for all that the Lord God reigns supreme. It's one thing to hear the story of God's worth. It's another thing altogether to see it. Listen, the only thing, the only thing that will finally unite our heart pull us back from that divided opinion. The only thing that will do that is coming near to this hill to see God's supremacy on display for us in the broken body of Jesus Christ. And it's here that we as God's people have our hearts turned back to Him. It's here where we fall on our faces and we declare the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Church, we were in this desperate situation. Whether we felt like it or not, we were there without hope, facing certain death, starving spiritually. 
but in his wonderful kindness. His wonderful kindness. God made a promise, and he has kept it. God's gracious provision in Christ is a deluge beyond anything that we can imagine. And so I don't know the situations that everybody is facing here this morning. I don't know what Thanksgiving brought up for you. But God does. And even as you may be desperately scanning the horizon right now, looking to see are there any clouds yet, come close. Even as we wait, come close and see this treasure beyond price. Bow down in worship and experience the supremacy of God for you. Freely find in Him your all in all. Because He alone, He alone has no equal. And it's from our knees that as we listen closely, we'll start to hear the sound of rain. Let's close in prayer. Lord, what a gift. What a gift is your word to us. Lord, we, if, if we did not have your word, Lord, we'd be left with our own conceptions. We'd be left with our own interpretation, with our own understanding, and we would be desperate. And yet, Lord, you reveal your supremacy, not just for these folks thousands of years ago. You reveal it for us this morning. Lord, we as your people, Lord, what a joy it is to gaze on your supremacy for us, to see your grace poured out. Lord, I pray if there's anyone specifically here today dealing with that desperate situation, not knowing where to turn, feeling like they're falling and they don't know what to grab a hold of. Lord, I pray that this morning they would experience and see your infinite worth, your supremacy, that you reign supreme and you use that supremacy to become a man and die in our place. What a gift to know you through your son. Lord, I pray this week that we would turn our eyes to see the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.